Hello and welcome to Bajaj Exam Prep IAS. As part of a comprehensive analysis today, we have six very interesting articles for you from the Hindu newspaper Daily Edition. The topics itself are quite interesting. First, with regards to Japan's presence in the Indo-Pacific, it's a good news for India and generally for geopolitics in the Indian subcontinent and in the Indian Ocean world. Thereafter, 6G vision document document. So the concept of 6G now being pushed. We don't have full coverage of 5G, but 6G is now becoming the new buzzword. So what is this vision document itself? Thereafter, a very interesting development with regards to our foreign trade policy and our neighbors. We'll discuss that. Then a major breakthrough for ISRO with regards to the reusable launch vehicle. Then two interesting, very simple, but one related to export and the other one related to the national park in Kerala itself. And therefore, we have a whole coverage from GS paper 2 to 3 and more than that prelims oriented preparation. As always, once this session is over, there will be a quiz on the Telegram channel. So you can go and attempt that so as to revise what we've done in this session itself. Now, let's begin our analysis for today. When we talk about Japan, when we talk about the Indo-Pacific itself, there has been a lot of churn and a lot of discourse vis-a-vis -vis the Indo-Pacific. Firstly, Russia and China are now trying to change it to Asia-Pacific itself. And when we talk about the Indo-Pacific, it is very contested. It is contested with China trying to spread its wing, wings throughout this section, the string of pearl theory, the concept of America trying to undercut that. There are different configurations also with regards to AUKUS, which would be UK, US and Australia. You have Quad as a major concept with regards to India and Japan coming through with Australia and the US. Now there are different configurations but when we talk about the Indo-Pacific itself it's contested for sure and China's presence is a problem. But when we talk about world powers and they're trying to influence geopolitics, Japan has not always been considered a very active partner. Though it has been talking about a lot of things over a period of time, when we talk about its partnership or generally its active role in Indo-Pacific, it has been quite minimal. And though it is a part of these organizations, it's quite lethargic. There's a lot of inertia when it comes to their response to a lot of things. However, the visit of the Japanese Prime Minister and the March month itself has been quite significant because now there's a new concept which has been introduced by Japan with regards to a free and open Indo-Pacific. Now this type of policy used to be under Shinzo Abe. Thereafter there has been a little bit of a limbo period. Now we see this new type of understanding with regards to free open Indo-Pacific. Now before I go into the nitty gritty of the articles itself, try to understand the basic point of this article generally written from an academic perspective but has a lot of important details for us for the mains examination. Now when we talk about Japan, as I said Japan has been seen as an important partner as of right now in G7 it is the president, India is the president, has the presidency of G20 itself and it is trying to bring these two organizations together and therefore trying to get partnership of India and Japan vis-a-vis -vis G7 and G20. However, however, there was always this concept that Japan is not fully committed to the security of the Indo-Pacific, which has now been challenged vis-a-vis -vis the free and open Indo-Pacific concept and India and Japan's strategic partnership. Now, in this whole concept, there are four basic pillars on which Japan is trying to play the whole Indo-Pacific game. First, by calling it Indo-Pacific, it is giving a lot of emphasis to India itself. There's a movement away from this concept of Indo-Pacific vis-a-vis China and Russia trying to call it Asia-Pacific with this concept of Indo in that sense is now being trying to being challenged in a way. Now, the next is they are trying to talk about connectivity. They're trying to talk about open passage. But more than that, it's about multilateral connections. So what Japan is now seeing is that vis-a-vis -vis as a superpower, if you want to call it, or as a power which has a major bearing with regards to the East South China Sea, Japan needs to take an active role. And therefore, this FOIP, what is called the new policy of the Japanese, 
is a welcome change with regards to India because now India has an active partner to undercut the Chinese. Because with regards to the South China Sea, India has no stake in the South China Sea. Generally, vis-a-vis -vis trade, it is important. But when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, the Indian Ocean itself, Japanese presence is important. And therefore, this new concept of free, open Indo-Pacific is a welcome change for India generally. So, when, when the Japanese Prime Minister visited this time, he is talking about global and bilateral issues. But he is talking about G7 and G20 coming together. And because Japan is the president of the G7 and India being the president of the G20, these two can make sure that multilateral institutions become in a way more relevant and still have or still show in a way relevance in this new political world. And more than that, more than that, because the geopolitics as of right now is quite skewed and quite confusing, and there is no basic stance with regards to maybe Russia and Ukraine. It is important that there is some coherence and there is some form of clarity which is pushed through by Japanese. So, the new concept which was unveiled by the Prime Minister was the Japan's new plan for a free open Indo-Pacific and Japan-India strategic special strategic and global partnership. Now, this is significant for India because at least the Japanese are looking at us as a strategic partner in the Indo-Pacific and generally a force to reckon with and to undercut the Chinese. Further, this policy is refreshing and is timely and is important. Why? Because there are numerous challenges to the Indo-Pacific as of right now with regards to the Ukraine war, because of inflation, the food security issue, cyberspace and the Chinese as it is are known to be properly attacking certain countries when it comes to the cyber security and cyberspace itself. Further, freedom of seas and connectivity. Now, freedom of seas is basically an in indirect way of saying South China Sea and China's what we call as aggressive stance in that area. And further, further, what is lacking as of right now in geopolitics in world politics itself is the concept of what the interna international order wants or should be. Basically, there are differing positions. China is pivoting towards Russia. India itself has taken a pragmatic stance with regards to Russia. The NATO countries have taken a different type of stance. Russia itself has taken a different type of stance. Therefore, when we talk about the world order, there was much more clarity before Russia-Ukraine. It was not as complicated because Europe is so dependent on Russian natural gas and generally energy. The stance of the EU itself has been quite problematic in the larger perspective of geopolitics. Therefore, therefore, what it is saying is that when we come to this world order, when we talk about the international order itself, what should it be? And what should be a response to certain things? There's no consensus, but it's about consensus building. So the first and foremost point, which is being pushed as of right now, is that Japan's active partnership and active role in the Indo-Pacific is important. Further, with regards to the aspect related to the Ukraine war and how there's a lot of threat with regards to cyberspace and movement of trade vis-a-vis -vis the South China Sea, in that context and the very chaotic response to Russia Ukraine itself, Japan wants to introduce certain principles into the world and that too, India as an active partner in that principle. So therefore, therefore, when we talk about this free and open Indo-Pacific, there are basically four pillars of co cooperation on which Japan wants to do this. First being the principle of peace and rules for prosperity. Basically, it wants to reiterate in a more technical way the fact that there needs to be free passage, no aggression and this major arms race as of right now vis-a-vis -vis getting military bases throughout the, the in Indian Ocean itself and the Indo-Pacific itself. So, from the African coast to Australia, how there is a major tension which is building up vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis military bases where countries have no place to be there but they're still there and therefore this principle of peace is very important and further rules for prosperity. Now this is an important point because it talks about vulnerable countries, 
countries which are dependent on these big powers and rules for prosperity would mean that basically the countries which are dependent on peace for their own GDP itself, they should have certain certainty and there should be a larger rule of international order which allows for that. Further, it says addressing challenges in an Indo-Pacific way. This is technically about undercutting. It's about undercutting the American narrative in the Indo-Pacific itself. Because what Japan is arguing is that we tend to wait for either the Americans or the British or the EU to respond to certain ways. And when it comes to our own interests, we are not safeguarding them. Therefore, being Indo-Pacific security or what we call as security order based regime, these countries are very, very important. And more than that, they should now approach the challenges in an Indian way, in a Japanese way, in an Indo-Pacific way. Therefore, we need to pivot away from this security complex which has been created vis-a-vis -vis the US, the UK or the EU and move away from that and move and shift the policy into India itself, into Japan itself and we dictate how we respond to the challenges. Because America has been dictated, is dictating a lot of things in the Indo-Pacific itself and therefore there needs to be a pivot away from an American perspective. Further, multi-layered connectivity which is that we should have land routes, we should have sea routes but more than that whatever organizations we have, for example we have BBIN, for example we have BIMSTEC, for example we have ACR, these should get connected to each other and they should not exist in isolation. Last but not the least, the concept of security and safe use of sea and air. Basically, trade should be free. There should be no threat or aggressive politics towards free trade in this area. Now, why is this discussion important for you generally for your preparation? Because uh, Japan, which is deeply invested in the Indo-Pacific security and stability and prosperity, is a good news for India and generally this area. Because... Japan has shown historically an inertia in responding to a lot of issues. So therefore, let's try to summarize this whole article. It's a Japan-oriented concept but has it bearing on India. Three basic principles are being discussed here. First is that Japan has shown over a period of time historically inertia. It has not been an active partner. Second, with regards to how the world order, the international order has Give, has given a very chaotic, problematic response to a lot of challenges which are there. Further, it is a challenging time itself. And third is these four principles which are based on changing the security regime, the, the security order itself which is based on the US and shifting it away from the US, an Indo-Pacific way, prosperity, peace and safe passage guaranteed. So it's a very simple concept, a very interesting article with regards to how Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific is important and it is now trying to find its feet and space within that also. So therefore, for India as a strategic partner to the Japanese, it becomes important that we also cooperate and help the Japanese in becoming a more active partner. Because when it comes to this whole order, it is only the Japanese who are there in the South China Sea. Australia or India both are in the Indian Ocean world itself and therefore the Japanese have to play and will play and needs to play a much more active part in undercutting the Chinese interests and aggressive politics in this sector. So are we clear with regards to what is the basic point of this article which is Japan's active role, the importance of that and the four principles on which it's trying to do that and which were technically inaugurated vis-a-vis -vis the interaction which happened recently. Okay, perfect. With this, we move to 6G. Now, when we talk about 6G, see, it seems as absurd. Why? Why is it absurd? Because most of us don't have 5G access. There are 45,000 villages in India which technically don't have access to 4G. We all use 4G. We get some amount of 5G, some people have it, most of the people, 95% of the population does not have access to 5G. 
and now the government is talking about 6G. Now, how is 5G and 6G different in the sense that 6G basically is considered 50 times more faster than 5G. The latency, which is the delay in between a packet of data going, is going to be microseconds, which is touted as 1000 times faster than 5G. And more than that, it is going to now use certain technologies based on satellites which is not there in 4G or 5G. 5G is more a tower based concept which 6G is going to be pushed via constellation of satellites. Now 4G access itself is problematic. 5G access we don't have. Talking about 6G becomes futile. However, here the government has an argument and that argument becomes important for us which is that India had delayed the introduction of 5G and that is why the infrastructure as of right now is not ready. So what happened was that the US and South Korea were very active in pushing 5G itself and therefore, therefore they had the whole infrastructure and everything ready even before India thought about bringing in 5G. What the government of India is trying to talk about here in the vision document itself is that we need to catch this train as quickly as possible or take out what, what is called the 6G out of the oven as quickly as possible so that we can transition to it more quickly. And because we did not create the requisite infrastructure or the knowledge system or the expertise in India with regards to 5G, we are struggling right now. Therefore, this vision document talks about the fact that we need to create an ecosystem in which 6G is supported is actually seen as a very realistic alternative to 5G. We have not still fully harnessed the concept of 5G with regards to maybe medical sciences or businesses have not used it, but 6G can be used in that regard. We can create an awareness about it. And third is that there, there are talking about an apex body which is going to spearhead this whole process. It is going to incentivize certain institutions. It's going to incentivize research how these machinery or this machine and this infrastructure can be created before 6G is ready itself. So it's about how we bring these two things together which is first we are ready to adopt it as quickly as possible and second is that we don't do the same mistakes as we did in 5G, which is to wait for it to work and then shift to it. That is why we don't have any infrastructure. And as it is, that infrastructure is quite expensive because we didn't pioneer the innovations in that area. So this vision document, as I, as I said, is, is a concept which is still developing. It seems as a futile activity. However, for UPSC aspirant, it becomes important because it is something which is the future of India and here India wants to bank on something which we missed last time. So when the 5G train left, we were waiting for the second train to come in. Here it was about being the engine for the 6G train itself and creating an ecosystem in India to support it. So it's an interesting article, it's an interesting point itself and we need to now be aware with regards to 6G. So. On 22nd March itself, the Prime Minister had unveiled a Bharat 6G vision document as a starting point for policy makers and the industries for the next generation of telecommunication or telecom. Though this was the basic emphasis, the ground reality is that close to 45,000 villages lack 4G connectivity and 5G networks don't exist or infrastructure does not exist in most of the areas. Some of us don't even have 5G phones in that regard because it's a futile concept itself. And in certain in parts of India, 4G phones are still working on 3G because of the problem of access to internet itself. Therefore, therefore, the advantages are there, but we don't have full coverage of 4G or 5G in that regard. Now, how is 6G different from 5G? We don't have to go into the technicalities, but basically for consumers, it's going to be faster internet speeds, better videos, heavier, what we call as movement of data in the same bandwidth itself, the same spectrum itself. And therefore, it's a new generation touted as 50 times faster as 5G. And 5G is considered 100 times faster than 4G. So it's a major leap in that regard. 
the businesses and government have still not used 5G to its full potential. And the basic point is for 6G, it's not about tower based concepts, something related to how the, the SpaceX program with regards to Starlink is very important, wherein satellite constellations with towers and base stations is going to be the way there will be an integrated network which will be created in the rural areas and the urban areas. Specifically in the rural areas, the infrastructure for 6G is not going to be enough. 5G and 4G is not enough. It has to be based on satellite technology. So therefore, there needs to be a certain pivot and orientation towards that technology right now itself. Therefore, therefore, the government has indicated certain things. Now this discussion becomes important for you because you would need to write it in the examination with regards to the potentiality of 6G. So first would be that they want to accelerate India's wireless data consumption and leadership when it comes to 6G technology itself. Therefore, they are encouraging local manufacturers and supporting Indian companies and engineers and creating an international discussion and concept of standardization when it comes to 5G, uh, when it comes to 6G. Basically, they want to pioneer the whole discussion and we want to basically be the spearhead or, or the leader with regards to 6G. Now, the major motivation here is where we see that there has been a mistake which was made last time is that India delayed the rollout of 5G because whilst US and South Korea were getting ready to roll it out, we were still checking if this concept is going to work for us. And now that 5G has actually become a reality, India now lacks the technological, what we call as prowess and more than infrastructure vis-a-vis -vis 5G. Therefore, we need certain types of towers, we need certain types of repeaters, we need certain types of satellites which need to be put into orbit at least 5 to 6 years before 6G is rolled out and therefore the basic groundwork needs to be done. In 5G, we waited for the South Koreans and the Americans to create the groundwork and over that we want to create our infrastructure. Here, India wants to be the foundation for 6G itself so that, so that we can change the narrative and we can harness the potential of this in that regard. Therefore, India does not want to repeat the same mistake it did with 5G and grab 6G from the oven. Basically saying that we can, we don't wait for it to develop, we develop it as a country itself. And that's a very good way of looking at technology, a very good pivot and orientation what we call as with regards to technological development. But vision document is a vision document. What happens further is a separate story altogether. But it's an encouraging development. It's an encouraging development for you. The potentiality of 6G is much greater. Though we can be cynical and say that basically 5G doesn't work, then how does 6G work? But the point is here it's not about making it work. Here it's about pioneering its development. Therefore, the Government is ready to support and will support research pathways and breakthroughs which can create the 6G network in such a way that it can lead to the academy and the companies and the community to come together and use this technology to its potentiality because 5G we are not using that is for sure. And there will be an apex body which will be created very soon which will remove all the roadblocks with regards to 6G research and generally fund mobilization and the goals are quite big in that regard that it will guarantee every citizen a minimum bandwidth of 100 mbps ensure every gram panchayat has a half a terabyte per second speed of connectivity blanket for the country with regards to 50 million internet hotspots and within 13 square kilometers of everybody now this all is what we call as conjecture. This is the target. For us, this target is quite far away. For us, what is more important is the way the government wants to go about it. First is about not waiting for other countries to pioneer, be the pioneering, what we call as ecosystem, which can create 6G. This is the most first, most important point, which is that we don't want to wait. We want to be the pioneer. Second is that we are creating the ecosystem with regards to academia, the industry and the fiscal needs for doing this research. 
and third is the fact that there's an apex body which is now being pushed or will be created to push 6G. This is a major change with regards to Indian telecom and Indian technological development because we've always looked towards the West for technology and then we adopt it. However, here it's not about adaptation or absorbing their technology, it's about creating that technology. So it's an interesting and important development, generally important for your preparation in that way because now 6G is going to become a buzzword across the different papers and generally in the mains examination, it has an important bearing for your GS paper 3. So I hope that you understand the importance of this article and why this vision document is a major change in the Indian orientation with regards to internet technology, satellite based technology and how we have done certain things in a certain way. 5G we missed the train, we want to be the pioneers here. Perfect, very good. Now, now comes an interesting change in India and here in itself India is now moving away from this idealism or what is called Gujral doctrine that basically we are obligated to help our neighbors. Basically Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Pakistan, we discount in that Sri Lanka. And India has always basically not ex accepted or expected reciprocity from these countries. So we don't expect anything from Bhutan, we don't expect anything from Nepal or we don't basically want anything back. And in that sense, when it comes to Nepal's foreign trade or when it comes to Bhutan's foreign trade, when it comes to Bangladesh foreign trade and even Sri Lanka in that way, India, when it comes to its foreign trade policy, has always dictated its movement in and out. Basically, if there's any good which is moving towards Nepal, India has always facilitated it. So when it comes to our neighbors itself, we have tried to always make sure that they get access to the sea easily, landlocked countries get the infrastructure which is needed to them and India has always in a way dictated it vis-a-vis -vis what is called bilateral treaties or bilateral interest, basically the interest of the nation and our interest. But as I said, India has never expected or accepted reciprocity. Basically, we don't do anything for Nepal or Bhutan for something back. But this has now changed. And with the new trade policy which has come in, the word bilateral relations has now been substituted with strategic and economic interests. Now this is an important development and this is very important because in a way our neighbors have been using us in a way. Because Nepal pivoted towards China, when China ditched it, then it came to India. Bhutan as it is, is now having independent relationships with China which was never the case. Bangladesh is a little bit unpredictable in that way. Pakistan you can't trust only. And Sri Lanka has also been in this what you call tight spot or crossfire in which it has been pivoting towards China itself. Now when it comes to our neighbors, if you are pivoting towards China, if you are pivoting towards Pakistan, then why should we not expect anything which is at least pro-India stance or at least neutrality when it comes to the relationship and why can't we, why can't we create a regime in which our economic interest and strategic interest also come into the picture. So if Nepal is so pivoted or so happy with China, then let's not allow the movement of goods which go to Nepal within India itself. Let China do that. If China is so important for your bilateral relationship, let us do one thing make China your major trade partner and let all the movement of goods and services move from China itself, let it come from Tibet itself. So if Nepal can do it, if Bhutan can do it, then we can also do it, which is that our strategic and economic interests are equally important. So this is called moving away from idealism to pragmatism. Basically idealism is that we are the big power. Now we are moving to pragmatism, which is being practical, which is basically if our interests are being undercut, if you will undercut our interests generally, then why should we support you? Why should we allow anti-India activity happening in your country itself be supported by Indian, what we call as, in a way, goodwill? Because we have always acted in goodwill. 
so this is a very interesting development with regards to our foreign trade policy because there's a shift and there's a shift in stance which is considered significant because now on allowing transit of goods in and out of neighboring countries the new foreign trade policy has introduced an additional consideration in providing such trade transit facilities for adjacent countries India's strategic and economic interest. If it is in, in the Indian interest, we will allow it. If it's not in the Indian interest, we will not allow it. Basically, if something is moving through India towards Nepal, towards Bhutan, towards Bangladesh, or India is facilitating whatever it is doing in the Bay of Bengal or the Arabian Sea for, for Sri Lanka, India will now, India will now change its orientation. Therefore, therefore, there's a change in language. There's a change in language of how we talk about this relationship. So the change language in provisions pertains to the transit facilities as well as the subtle shift in the stance with regards to trade with neighboring countries in the new foreign policy itself, foreign trade policy in that regard. And this would unnerve and this should be a major consideration for Nepal and Bhutan and basically Bhutan has shown a lot of, lot of attitude this time vis-a-vis -vis going with a border, what is called revision strategy with China independent of India. So now they're resolving their border disputes with China, which they never used to do whilst undercutting India. So, and the basic point is this is not something which is in India's interest. Bhutan has always been a, a neutral neighbor, an important neighbor. But it can't be that you take everything from us and allow China to pivot towards you and then also become pro-China because then it undercuts our interest. Therefore, the old foreign policy document, which is 2015 to 20, used to say, so this foreign trade policy doc doctrine with regards to 2015 20 used to say, and it's a very important part, this is the old stance, transit of goods through India from or to countries adjacent to India shall be regulated in accordance with bilateral treaties between India and those countries and will be subject to restrictions as may be specified by the Directorate General of Foreign Trade in accordance with international conventions. So it's a very standard thing that in, in this Indian interest is not highlighted, Indian interest is not pushed, it is not even mentioned in a way. It's just that if we have a good bilateral treaty, if you have a good free trade agreement with Bhutan, with Nepal, we will allow that. However, now, now under the new document, under section 2.23, the new foreign trade policy says that such transits of good shall be enabled and regulated in accordance with strategic and economic interests of India as well as bilateral treaties. Basically, now this strategic word is very, very important. Economic interests as it is, if it is some, if, if we are producing something and China is importing it from, or rather Nepal is importing it from China and then transporting it through India, then it is not in our economic interest. So we will make sure that that thing does not go through or basically our economic interest should not be undercut by imports which Nepal and Bhutan are making. But what is more important is basically strategic. Strategic. Why? Because strategic location, strategic concept and strategic security regimes are something which are the buzzword now. That what is our strategic interest in that area with with regards to nepal we've already seen how there was a major pivot towards china then aggression and then they're back to becoming pro india in that regard india allowed for movement but we did create a blockade and therefore therefore now that blockade becomes more institutionalized vis-a-vis -vis this concept of strategic and economic interest. So please remember these two words, strategic and economic interest, because this is going to be now the way India is going to weigh in its options itself. Further, further, the previous policy used to empower the Director General of Foreign Trade to frame schemes and issues necessary to promote and strengthen economic ties. 
but the new policy rephrases it vis-a-vis -vis to say promote and regulate trade so basically now it's not about building relationships vis-a-vis -vis trade it's about regulating trade in a way that it undercuts the interest of china or pakistan and promotes the interest of india itself therefore therefore before i move on to the prelims section prelims bite section is this basic concept clear why is this new change in policy so significant if it is then i'll give you the basic summary and then we'll move into the next section itself are we clear with regards to what have been we discussing till this point yes we are very good now what have we discussed till this point three basic but very interesting documents and in a way articles first is japan japan and its active role and how how Jap japanese interests have been always undercut by china but chinese presence is now also becoming daunting for the japanese and the japanese are now ready to actively play a part in the security regime of the indo-pacific and therefore they are talking about free and open indo-pacific which will allow for now listen to me which will allow for india to also have an upper hand because india and japan have historically had good relationship and they have a aligned interest vis-a-vis -vis china so the four principles which they've introduced the inertia of japanese and generally how india is at an advantageous position with regards to japanese becoming more proactive second we discussed the concept of and as of right now we discussed the concept of this new free what we call as foreign trade policy and our new foreign trade policy has been dictated by not the concept of bilateral treaties but economic and security and strategic interests of india and therefore we will not be the nice guy we have always been with regards to you doing anti inter activity and we allowing movement of goods and services to your country rather indian foreign trade policy is now going to be dictated by the interest of india and the strategic interest of india which is very significant and the third was the 6g document which we discussed a major change in how india wants to look towards telecom technology we waited for the 5g technology to get adopted or created or the foundations being laid and then we have moved to 5g which has led to a major delay in its adoption and the infrastructure has never been created in india itself in 6g we want to be the pioneers in that regard if this is clear then we'll move to the prelims section or the prelims bite section three very simple but important articles in that regard yes great okay now the first is a major breakthrough for the isro which is the reusable launch vehicle tech, uh, the technology demonstrator so basically the rlv is the future of indian space technology and satellite delivery basically today what happens is that the Uh, PSLV or the GSLV when it goes into orbit we lose the first stage we lose the second stage we lose the cryogenic stage itself the rocket itself is exhausted in a way however this concept is going to be that we will use a launch vehicle which will ha house the satellite in its in itself itself once it goes into orbit it will put the satellite into orbit and then come back into the indian uh, come back into the earth's orbit itself atmosphere and then land in india or in the bay of bengal and the arabian sea and we can reuse this basic basic launch vehicle so it's a reusable launch vehicle therefore cutting down the costs and allowing india to put in multiple satellites at the same point of time but we don't lose we don't lose the launch vehicle itself and for that the most important concept is that when we use a reu reusable launch vehicle it's about autonomous navigation and landing and what isro has demonstrated yesterday itself is that we have now landed or the launch vehicle itself has landed itself 
landed itself without any input from ISRO. So the autonomous maneuvering and landing procedures have been followed by the onboard system itself and this has proven to be successful. Therefore, therefore, ISRO's reusable launch vehicle landing test has now been successful. What we did was that we took the reusable launch vehicle to 4.5 kilometers via Chinook hel helicopter. Then we left it in the air. It started to glide back. But the basic point was there was no input from the ISRO. It was all automated and it automatically landed in the air base itself. And that is a major, major breakthrough because the gyroscopes or the basic navigation technology which is needed for this type of a rocket which is much bigger in scale is now at least tested and proven. So this major development with regards to the RV, RLV, TD is very, very significant and you can expect a certain type of question with regards to what is this concept, with regards to why is it so important in the larger space technology of India and the fact that we have now tested integrated navigation guidance and control systems. Basically, this was just a demonstrator. It is not to scale. It's a very small rocket, but it's a technology demonstrator. If we can get it at this scale, we can get it at a larger scale itself. So ISRO has now, now added another feather to its cap Basically, by developing indigenously the infrastructure which is needed or the technology which is needed for a reusable launch vehicle. This is going to be a game changer because as I said, PSLV and GSLV, we lose it in the process of sending satellites. We will not because this will land back after, after putting in the satellite, coming back into the orbit of the earth and then entering the atmosphere and landing close to India in such a way. The basic demonstration was that this was going to, it was landing on the Bay of Bengal. It was simulated. But the basic point is once left disoriented, it was able to orient itself and land in a certain way from four kilometers in the sky, which is very significant and a major breakthrough in that regard. So it's a very small, small concept, but significant with regards to our space technology. Then comes this concept of exports and a new definitional change. A very interesting development again vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine. Basically, this has been created. This has been created because of the Russia-Ukraine crisis itself and the concept of political risk in export guarantee schemes and insurance schemes are now being updated. What is the concept here? So what happens is that there are certain safeguards which a lot of our exporters have, which is an export guarantee scheme and insurance scheme under which, for example, we sent a consignment and the consignment before it reaches the country itself, there's a war or for some reason related to major development, there is the docking of that ship cannot happen and the export commodity has to come back. In that sense, there's a loss to the exporter, but that is covered under the insurance, under the insurance. However, what is not covered under insurance or the export guarantee scheme as of right now is what are called non-tariff barriers or the concept of the way there are sanctions which are being pushed into countries which are very quick to come in but now the exporters have no, no way to respond to it. So economic sanctions and non-tariff barriers were never covered under export guarantee scheme itself or insurance schemes itself. Now what India is doing is it's re revising the definition of political risk from just being war or the concept of major catastrophe to adding the word non-tariff barriers, economic sanctions or what we call as quick way in which certain countries are blocking the entry. So anti-dumping for example, for example, an anti-dumping policy from China can lead to major losses for India. But that loss is for the exporter. And that is what India is now trying to undercut. So exporters may soon be able to insure or have insurance coverage over losses which are suffered on account of sudden imposition of barriers to the trade under the for new foreign trade policy itself. And the concept is that small exporters are going to be supported. Now, the cons, the, what is the definition of political risk 
as of right now is basically war now the government will expand the definition of political risk under the export guarantee scheme for imposition of non tariff barriers such as the concept of an anti dumping policy and this will allow for our exporters or for the importing importing authority to at least have certain type of confidence in going to these countries therefore by importing nations after the shipment has left the indian shores so what happens is it takes one month 15 days it traveled towards for example russia and then economic sanctions came now there's no way to dock that ship itself so they will turn it back then who bears the losses and the exporters will then not be encouraged to go to russia itself what india is trying to do is even when there's economic sanction on certain countries we are ready to give you basic safeguards and basic insurance so typically the export credit guarantee corporation indemnifies or basically pays up to the exporter if there is loss when when there's a war like situation or sudden import restrictions but does not cover anti dumping steps or non tariff barriers basically this is again significant for your prelims examination because now under the new foreign trade policy which we discussed in a different context itself previously now there's a new concept itself the new concept is that we will remember we will also cover and ensure against sudden changes in economic policy vis-a-vis -vis tariff barriers non tariff barriers and economic sanctions it's a significant step to promote export in india and and it allows also foreign companies to come into india and export to certain countries which may, they may not be able to do from maybe china or america which is the way india is now trying to promote a regime in which we are ready to give you what we call as export guarantee we are ready to give you insurance and it's a major concept with regards to exporters because it takes a lot of time to push in or move such big tonnage of commodities therefore there needs to be a certain incentive and this is where we are creating that incentive regime now before i move to the next topic there are two basic concepts the new foreign trade policy export guarantees vis-a-vis -vis non trade barriers and basically economic sanctions and the first one was isro and the reusable launch vehicle itself the last small topic is related to a protected site you can expect this protected site now in the examination gs paper 3 generally important but for environment and ecology extremely important wherein Ervakulam National Park in Kerala for the first time has the what is called a fernarium. Basically, ferns are a type of plant which grow naturally in a soilless condition itself. These plants obtain water and nutrients from leaching from trees. Basically, they can be seen growing vis-a-vis -vis trees. They don't need they don't need soil in that regard, and therefore where there is a very dense forest ferns are quite quite standard and quite important part of the ecosystem itself now what the ereviculum national park has done they have created a proper fernarium in the sense that 52 varieties of ferns have now been planted in a systematic way to push to push a certain type of ecosystem and also portray a certain type of ecosystem ferns are an important aspect and an important indicator within that ecosystem and therefore a uh, fundarium is going to be very very significant more than that what is equally important for you is that the everculum national park is also the natural habitat of the nilgiri tahar a very important critically endangered animal from india and therefore therefore this is a significant development because that park is trying to change its orientation vis-a-vis -vis just not going towards fauna but flora also and this is going to and the proposed plan is to have 104 different varieties of ferns which are conserved and in a way in situ itself not ex situ because they are being conserved with the trees in which they are and therefore we are creating a certain ecosystem which can sustain these ferns and also create awareness about their importance in the larger context of the the tropical and deciduous ecosystems now before i go to the mains question 
let me give you a basic summary of what we've done today generally first and foremost we discussed japan's orientational change and its more proactive role in the indo-pacific second we understood the 6g document and how we can see that india has now pivoted towards a more proactive role vis-a-vis -vis technological development third we tried to understand the new foreign trade policy and in that foreign trade policy we have now seen that it's not just bilateral treaties and it's not just this reciprocation of goodwill vis-a-vis -vis nothing now india wants to safeguard its strategic and economic interests in when it comes to its neighboring countries and their trade then we move to the aspect related to prelims oriented preparation wherein we discuss the isro reusable launch vehicle technology demonstrator in which they've now demonstrated integrated navigation technology further we now understood that this topic is related to a national park itself air vehicleum nilgiri tar and most important is that there is ferns which are now being in situ conserved in this national park the first for india itself and last but not the least is how now there's an export guarantee scheme when it comes to non tariff barriers and more than that it is creating an incentivized regime vis-a-vis -vis we can trade with certain countries which are erratic with regards to their trade policy so i hope all of this is is clear yes or no yes okay perfect so let's look at the main questions discuss the challenges and opportunities that 6g technology holds for india a very significant very easy but representative question for you then question number two india's new foreign trade policy is more pragmatic than idealistic now this is a gs paper two and this is a gs paper three question and i hope that you can understand that how we are moving away from idealism towards pragmatism being more practical so if these two questions make sense to you and you can use whatever has been taught in the past 50 minutes and I would also encourage you to go and attempt the MCQ questions which come as soon as the session is over. Thank you so much for your patience. I will see you soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.